circle, yes, we rotate 360 degrees, high high, 360 degrees, high high, 306, 306, 360 degrees, high high. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Full Circle, your cultural affairs radio magazine produced by members of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program and broadcasting right here at KPFA in Huchin, occupied Ohlone Territory, a.k.a. Berkeley. And tonight, Full Circle comes to you with two different takes on current events and the important roles women play in shaping today's society. On tonight's show, graduate apprentice Darlene Pagano returns in a conversation with feminist artist, author, and historian Max Dashu of the Suppressed History Archives. Their conversation about lifting up women's roles. We also get a youth perspective on police and policing from young women organizing and protesting in Antioch around police reform and out-of-control cops. All that and more tonight on Full Circle. I am your host, Freewell and Franklin. Keep it locked right here to KPFA. Again, welcome to Full Circle, the weekly show produced by apprentices of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. I am your host tonight, Freewell and Franklin. Well, it's almost July 4th, the day the United States claims as its Independence Day, a day that is supposed to represent freedom for all. But we know that's not true. All we have to do is look at today's news and we could see the fight for equal rights and fair treatment is still on for the great many of us. Well, in honor of this latest and powerful uprising from the masses, we want to highlight some of the work that people are doing. In particular, we want to uplift women's roles, and really, women have been playing a very powerful role in a lot of these latest actions around the country. One place where it is happening is out in the Far East Bay Area, out in Antioch, on the eastern edges of Contra Costa County. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Antioch out here, just about 50 miles east of San Francisco. This is a place where many people have been moving to as they get priced out of Oakland and San Francisco and the surrounding areas closer to the Bay. That being the case, the demographics of Antioch are changing, and I feel with those changes has come a change in acceptance of the way the police behave out here. For years, the Antioch Police Department has been getting away with some terrible treatment of a certain segment of their community. You can go back and look at the Community Action Team, or CAT as it was called. They were sued and disbanded after it was determined that they were harassing people in Section 8 housing. That's one example of many. Right now, the latest fight in Antioch is over the hiring of the killer cop, Michael Malone, and also threatening statements made by the Police Officers Association President, Steve Aiello, about protesters who may flip the bird at police. Let's check out this interview I did with some of the young women organizers and protesters out in Antioch. Welcome, everyone. This is Freewell and Franklin bringing back a youth perspective on police and policing. And although we will be speaking about cases and actions out here in Antioch, we are sure this will resonate with people all around the state and the country that hear it. Let's just start tonight. I just want to go around the phone and get people's uh, names so we could introduce everybody and just tell us about how old you are. Uh, where you went to school, maybe where you may be going to school next, and how long you've lived in Antioch. And let's start with Zoe. Hi, my name is Zoe. Um, I went to Antioch High School. I'm 18 years old, a recent graduate, and I'm going to study computer science at Chico State. And how long you lived in Antioch? Uh, I lived in Antioch for uh, 10 years. All right. And then go ahead, Tanner. My name's Tanner. I'm 19. I've lived in Antioch for 
around five years and uh, I went to high school at College Park and I go to LMC now. All right, LMC. I went there. All right. And Mm -hmm. lastly, we have Lacey. How you doing, Lacey? Hey, Frank. Um, My name is Lacey. I am 24. Um, I have lived in Antioch on and off my whole life. My husband has lived in Antioch his whole life. I actually went to Liberty High School. Um, He went to Antioch High School and I continued on for interior design at the New York Institute of Art and Design and um, also in real estate. All right. Well, welcome all tonight to bring us this youth perspective and the woman's voice of, of the activities and the actions out there. So thanks for being here tonight. Well, there have been a lot of actions around Antioch these last few weeks. And before we get into the most recent action at City Hall, let's talk about what we're really focused on right now at this point. And we'll start with uh, Lacey here. Tell us about the two officers that have become the center of attention for these these recent actions. Let's first talk about Officer Michael Malone. Definitely. Um I mean, so much on the table, so much on the agenda. Um, Our first kind of item of business is Officer Michael Malone and Corporal Stephen Aiello, who is also the president of the Police Officers Association um, in Antioch. And Officer Michael Malone was hired from San Francisco Police Department. Um, He was one of two officers to shoot and kill Luis Gungora Pat in San Francisco, um, a homeless man who was also Mayan. Um, and he, so during the investigation, um, the Department of Police Accountability recommended a 45 day suspension for him while they did some further investigating. And instead of facing that discipline and that suspension, he decided to hop on over to Antioch where he had previously worked. Um, and he was hired here. So he's now um, an officer of the Antioch Police Department and he evaded any kind of discipline or suspension um, for that shooting. And Stephen Aiello is the president of Police Officers Association, and he has been publicly defending um, Officer Michael Malone on social media. And um, a few days into that, he there was a screenshot taken of a comment that he made on basically a photo of a female protester flipping off a police officer. And his comment was, that he believed an open hand slap to the face would be 100% justified in that instance. And while, you know, we don't recommend it, the flipping off a police officer, the court has decided that it's protected under your First Amendment right to freedom of speech. And so we have requested that he step down because obviously the officers in Antioch, if that's the type of leadership that they have, you know, we're not confident that any real discipline and accountability will be taking place. Yeah. So that's been the main focus of the fight the last few days. And there's been a lot of actions, um, several marches uh, from the high school to the police station. Uh, The high schoolers had blocked the intersection. We've had numerous marches from the Antioch city park to the police station and to city hall. But we recently had a very successful action, which was, this past Monday at the Antioch City Hall. Zoe, you were a part of that action. Tell us about the action at City Hall on Monday, um, what y'all did, and what do you think the impact that it had? Yeah, so um, on Monday, we blocked off all of the entrances to City Hall, and we asked the workers to respectfully um, respect our our picket line, our peaceful protest and um i think we made an impact on the workers there it, it kind of put a little bit of pressure on them um the uh, the cops eventually came and let the workers come in i think that it put pressure on them to like think about our our point of view um i don't think it it made a difference yet but if we keep putting pressure on the people who have control um over what's going on Um, We want to defund the police in Antioch because they get 62% of our general fund budget. And um, I think that just putting pressure on them makes a difference because they're they're not going to change if we ask nicely. We have to show them that this is what we want. We have the numbers and you guys need to do what we say. 
Yeah, I think um, the pressure is working. Because that's what the people want. Yeah, the people have been out there, and it, it's been a sustained uh, movement out here. And I'm my spirits have been lifted by it to see the the finally the mass movement out here being someone that has been doing this um, since my encounter with the police in 2009. So I've been at it a decade, and this is the most action I've ever seen. Well, also on the line with us, Tanner, and you have been attending many of these protests. Talk about your experience just being there and what kind of impact do you think it has? Initially getting involved was a little intimidating because, you know, I am young and it feels like something, uh, you know, for adults to handle. But because I'm, you know, a young adult at this point, I thought it was important to get out there and just learn and just listen to, you know, what's going on and at, as I've been going to these protests, I've been learning a lot about organizing and um, more about issues, you know, in my community, which like as a kid you or a teenager, you know, you're not really paying close enough atten- attention to. Well, I would say Sorry. it's all right. Oh I would say God, having your you. um, having your presence know. there has been um, a blessing to us, actually, because people coming out and just putting our numbers up has been a tremendous help. And you have also been at the uh, city hall now, which has been, I wouldn't say permanently because no one's camping overnight, but we're out there every morning and you've been a fixture there creating uh, some great art, um, some chalk art throughout the day. So I think we've really appreciated having you around. So I hope you keep it up. Well, let's talk about what this pressure so far has led to because we have had a special meeting of the city council it's kind of like a cyber town hall meeting on police reform the first one was this past tuesday let's just go around and the room and see what your all perspective is on this meeting we had kind of like a watch party down at the resource center some of us watched it down there Um, let's start with Lacey. what did you think of the city council meeting do you think anything will come from what they discussed well, um, I'm a, I'm a bit more critical than your average person, I would say. And so as usual, I'm not, um, super impressed uh, with our leadership in Antioch. However, you know, baby steps are not, they are steps forward. Um, originally I did really feel like this whole special meeting was, um, really just lip service. They had a lot of pressure from literally hundreds and hundreds of citizens to do something and they but they didn't want to do exactly what we were asking for. So they, I feel like they felt like, you know, just having a community forum would be sufficient, but it did open up the conversation. Um, To me, this particular meeting felt like um, it felt repetitive because we had already heard from the community. They had already heard from the community. They know what we want. They know what we're looking for. Um, But they did do some brainstorming on, you know, how they could take the next steps. I know they were talking about hiring a third party facilitator um, to kind of look at these issues. Um, Mayor Wright went over kind of a bulleted list of what he had heard from the the public comments and they're using that third party facilitator to go through that list is what it sounds like to me and see what action can be taken. Um, I don't think it's dramatic enough. I don't think it's um, nearly the level of, of action and change that is necessary for the serious issues that we're facing here in Antioch. But I am glad that um, we're moving forward, though, be it very slowly. Yes, the the conversation is actually happening, which is a first step. And one thing that was shocking to me about being a part of the not only the marathon two day meeting they had last week where they had to take about seven hours to hear 700 um, public comments. And many of the, and then, you know, the special meeting Tuesday, most of the comments that were critical of the police were certainly tapping in on Officer Malone and Officer Aiello. And one thing that stood out to me was when they started their discussion as a city council, those two names weren't even mentioned in their, their conversation. And I think um, that's why we're out there every day. And I think we're going to try to maintain that presence at the Antioch City Hall until we actually get some answers about what's happening with Malone and um, Aiello. But let's let's ask our other two guests here. Uh, Zoe, 
Did you watch the city council meeting? And if you did, what was your thoughts about this special town hall that they held? You know, um, my parents watch it, watched it, but I personally um, don't quite fully believe in the reform and just kind of the whole situation. But of course, I I do uh, support it and I will um, encourage people to support it as well. But I personally didn't watch the meeting. But what I what I think about what they're doing is like what Lacey said, they're they're doing a lot of lip service and they're not really giving us what we what we want and what we need. But they're really trying to um, um, act like they're they're um, getting stuff done. They're working on it. They want to hear everyone's side, Aiello side, um, Malone's side. They're going to investigate him. But, you know, they do these investigations and they try to they try to um, waste time and like it's like kind of like a uh like a game to see who holds out the longest and like i really think that um once people stop paying attention to what's going on they're waiting for people to um stop paying attention and once they do they're gonna just drop it like they do all the time that's that's kind of what i and i think that's why it's important that that. we keep the pressure on as we have been doing so um I'm very excited for you all that we've been out there together and that we are maintaining a presence at the front of that city hall with our signs and stuff. And for all you listeners, I'll be posting some pictures on our website after the show, kpfaapprentice.org. Well, what about you, Tanner? Because I know you watched a lot of the meeting. What was your takeaway kind of watching the city council process? I feel like they are just kind of waiting for this problem to sort of go away and for people to stop paying attention. And I think it was evident in the way that like a couple meetings ago, there was 700 comments. And at this one, there was only like 95. And so you can kind of see how the or how the pressure might already starting how the pressure might already feel like it's starting to dwindle. But, you know, with these protests, I really don't think that we're going to stop. And there is only just a few of us out there, but if we can get more people to show up and if we can just keep going, um, I think it'll just like prove that, you know, this problem, like our attention is not going to go away and we're not going to, you know, stop as much as they think that, or as much as they're uh, hoping uh, for us to. And it seemed like the, the people missing at the special town hall were more the pro police people because it seemed like at the special town hall, it had a, a more of an abundance of the um, the reform police reform people. So I felt like that was a good one. That's true. Well, um, that was pretty. Yeah, that was the voice of Tanner. Um, just graduated high school a while back, and also Zoe and Lacey as well. We're gonna take a quick break right here on Full Circle, and we'll be right back with more youth perspective on police and policing. <laughs> Right now in 
seeming like their job is to make attraction for us. Crazy part about it, it only happened to us. They brought us here against our will. Now they ain't happy with us. That's crazy. Now they talking about be cool. No, let people do what they do. I see a lot of people not saying nothing. Like, what if that was you? Huh? What if that was your brother? What if that was your family? What if that was your son? What if that was all you had? Okay, welcome back. This is Free Rolling Franklin, and you are listening to 94.1 KPFA. And that song you just heard was Mr. Officer by T. Grizzly, featuring Queen Naija and members of the Detroit Youth Choir. And we are here tonight getting a youth perspective and basically the voice of young women in the movement tonight. These young women here are 18 to 22 years of age, and they're our future. So we're trying to listen to what they're saying tonight. And we want to wrap up tonight getting their thoughts on the defund the police ideas and what that would actually look like to you all. So what does that actually look like to you? Because I think a lot of people feel like they hear defunding the police, that means no police. And although that would be an ultimate goal, to be at a place where police were not needed and had become obsolete. But that's not just the case with defunding the police. So let's just start with you, Zoe, because I know you've been thinking about this a lot. Um, Then we can move around into the circle here. But what does it mean to you to defund the police? Well, to me personally, I think that the police should definitely not have enough money where they have um, patrol cars, they have people just driving around waiting to see if someone is doing something wrong. Um, I don't think the police should have enough money in their budget to do homeless encampment removals. And these people don't have any resources. Defunding the police right now would be lowering their, their percentage that they get of the general budget. They get 62% of our, our general budget in the city. And um, that's just entirely too much. We need, we need those funds to be reallocated to to social services. We need more extracurricular activities for students. We need um, better books in our schools. A lot of a lot of other school systems don't even use textbooks anymore. They use like the new technology. But these police are are entirely overfunded. They just they have a, a tank sitting in the back of the police department. It's not a war zone. It's just a regular, small, suburban town. Well, what about you, Lacey? What does it seem like to you to defund the police? And what would you like to see some of the funds go to? So I definitely agree with everything that Zoe was saying. And if you look at the way that Antioch is currently using the funds that are going to the police, so they have that, what what do they call it, the mine-resistant rescue vehicle. I don't know the last time... I saw any landmines in Antioch, but we have a special SWAT team. We were able to purchase hundreds of thousands of dollars in special tactical gear and equipment for that team, but we don't have body cameras. And we found out last night that they had purchased the body cameras, but had not purchased any kind of software to store that data. And so I'm just curious as to why we need that huge, basically a military tank that absolutely does not get used and taxpayers are paying to maintain and ensure when our own officers who are consistently being accused of misconduct and excessive force, they don't have body cameras. And so there's really no way to truly hold them accountable. I mean, there's no room for transparency. Something that I would love to see for Antioch is for those funds to be reallocated into 
um, services for the homeless and also um, for kind of separating um, the police. We always talk about the police wearing a multitude of hats. And, you know, we say they're not social workers. They respond to all these different kinds of calls. I think that when you're dealing with someone with uh, mental illness or drug addiction, we have basically kids who went through a few weeks of training and are armed with a lethal weapon going out and, and handling these people. When we need educated social workers and people with degrees um, and experience in being able to help those people that, you know, instead of sending the police to respond to those types of calls, um, I especially see it with the two officers that are assigned to handling our homeless community. One of them was reassigned from our gang task force. He has absolutely no compassion or understanding and we're wasting ten to $50,000 every time him and public works are called out to go basically move them on to the next street and just completely upset them and uproot their entire life. And I think that we could be using our money more effectively, more efficiently. And I think that we would see a big difference. A lot of companies and people do not want to come to Antioch because of the way that it is. Our our problem with homelessness, our problem with drug addiction, to really bring back the value in the city of Antioch, we have to address the people that need help. And so I think that the money and the funds for that could come from the police department. Definitely. I'm with that. And Tanner, you're out there. Have you given some thought to what you would like to see if you could defund the police? Where would you put extra money towards? I would like to see the money go back into the community and uh, fixing things like our homelessness issue, because we are a suburb. And so why do we have, you know, this problem um, when we're supposed to have enough funds to take care of everything and all that money is going to the police. Um, homeless people aren't the problem. Uh, homelessness is the problem. And so I don't know why we keep uh, funding the police, funding to get the homeless people kicked out when we can really be taking care of our people. That's right. We need to put that money where it needs to be to actually help prevent the problems where the police have to come in If we could eliminate some of the need for the police, you know, by taking care of our brothers and sisters out there living on the street and coming um, myself, having a personal battle with addiction, I know um, how much a helping hand can mean to somebody when they're kind of lost in that drug world. Well, we're really uh, wrapping up and out of time here. I want to thank you three for helping me and helping us get kind of a youth perspective on what's been happening. And I'd like to throw out any um, websites or contact information. I know, Lacey, we've been using the Make a Stand in your community. Is that still a good place for people to get information? Absolutely. I'd say um, everyone can get a lot of information about um, the city of Antioch, the things that are happening, um, and the things that have happened in the past especially regarding APD in the Make a Stand in Your Community um, page on Facebook. And Zoe, are you all still using the Instagram defund Antioch PD? Yes, we are using that Instagram still. Any other contacts that we should be aware of? Or are those the best two you all think? Um, I think there, there's another Instagram, if I remember correctly, it's Refund Antioch, and they'll be posting um, the protests and the um, calls to action to make uh, comment cards on the city council meeting, I all believe. All right, yeah, and um, I definitely will. Zoe already knows the procedure. We will post all the links to those contacts on our website, kpfaapprentice.org just after the show tonight. And I'll also link there some photos of our recent actions, some news clips, because we actually have been getting a lot of news coverage out there and um, any other vital information that you may need. Well, let me say thank you to um, you young women tonight for actually stepping up and being part of the movement out there and not just a part, but a major part. I know um, a lot of you are organizing and you know, trying to hold a, a little area down for, you know, the whole day takes a lot of effort. And I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. So I thank you all. Thank you for having us. Thank you, yeah, Frank. Thank you. All right, you all, I will say good night and we'll talk in the future. 
Welcome back. This is Full Circle on 94.1 KPFA. And before that little music break, you heard my interview with young women activists organizing out here in Antioch. And if you are trying to stay on top of what's happening out here in Antioch, be sure to check out and like the Facebook page, Make a Stand in Your Community. If you're not on Facebook, try Defund Antioch PD and Refund Antioch on Instagram. And, of course, we will have a link to all these social media handles on our website, kpfaapprentice.org, just after the show. There we will also have a flyer posted of an action coming up on Sunday, July 12th, and contact information for that march and rally. Again, that's kpfaapprentice.org for more details just after the show. Now to continue our conversation on uplifting women's roles, I'll pass the mic to graduate apprentice Darlene Pagano. She recently spoke with feminist artist, author, and activist Max Dashu of the Suppressed Histories Archives. I'm Darlene Pagano, a graduate of the KPFA Apprenticeship Program, which brings you full circle. In this July 3rd show, I wanted to highlight the roles of women in resistance and insurrection, not in reference to our July 4th holiday as a date given to the successful completion of our American Revolution, but to the women of 2020, who are the backbone, the spirit, and the leadership of the current civil resistance that has flared up, triggered by the visual documentation of police actions resulting in the deaths of African American citizens. Whenever I want to gather historic information about women's lives, I automatically start with the Suppressed Histories Archives. For 51 years, the archives has diligently and meticulously collected the stories worldwide of the rarely recorded lives of women from prehistory, from antiquity, up to contemporary accounts in art, writings, and music. They have scoured to cull what clues and documentation can be recovered to compile the rich history of women's lives. The archives is the brainchild in life's work of historian and archivist Max Dashu. She and I had a remote, socially distanced interview as she answered my questions about women's actions historically in political resistance and civil insurrection. The answers were stories of numerous women, far too many to include in one show. It seems that one would be hard-pressed to find even one social justice event that was not supported, populated, led, or oft-times started by women. Tonight, we're presenting just one of a number of reports that will give just a glimpse of the unending history of women defending and protecting their peoples from oncoming oppression. From the Suppressed Histories Archives, I give you Max Dashu. Today, I wanted to talk about women in resistance movements and insurrections women who took political action in a variety of ways, not necessarily military, but also cultural. I found several different groupings around this, looking through my records. One is the actual military resistance to invasion or risings after colonization. Another is revolt leaders against slavery, so specifically that struggle. And a lot of this information, the bulk of it actually that I have here, is from the Caribbean. There were a lot of anti-slavery revolts there. And then there's a broader category of women who advocated for their communities. And this could be working class women like Big Margot, who carried the standard in the rising of Ghent, which was a weaver's revolt in the 1300s. Or it could be indigenous women in the 17, 18, 1900s that the country had already been conquered, but they organized against oppressive taxation or other injustices and so wound up leading risings or political action movements. You know, there's a lot of overlap in this 
the the I put together a, a visual talk called Rebel Shamans Women Confront Empire. And what I found there is that the bulk of the leadership for these types of movements came from indigenous women, whether you're in Africa or the Americas or the Philippines, other places. That's like a major, major historical pattern. And sometimes when I was first really doing video about this, I was just looking at women who are political leaders, and I began to notice that a lot of those political leaders were, in fact, spiritual authorities in their cultures. So they were seers, diviners, medicine women. So, so spiritual leadership and political leadership intertwine very intimately in a lot of this history. And I just find that fascinating because a lot of times we're presented with this false polarization, you're spiritual or you're political. But in these native movements, it wasn't like that. The spiritual principles of the culture actually created a foundation from which women could lead. And that included in societies that were fairly patriarchal. But there was a way in which that spiritual leadership propelled them to the forefront. And often, too, they would, they would take risks that men didn't take. Quite a few examples of women who are these kinds of lead, leaders. For example, in Chiapas, which still has a revolutionary tradition today with the Zapotistas, there was a woman in 1712 named Maria Candelaria, and she was a Tzental Maya woman. That by this time, the Spanish had ruled for almost 200 years. They'd been occupying the country. Catholicization had gone forward, but people were still really holding on, as they even do now today, to the Maya traditions. And so Maria Candelaria begins by creating a shrine to the Catholic goddess, right? But under the Maya underneath that. And the local priest ordered her to tear it down, and she refused. And so the priest sent to San Cristobal, where the bishop was, and he sent armies out, and they destroyed the shrine. As a result, the outcome was that Maria Candelaria spearheaded a movement, a, a confederacy, really, of Maya people, not only from different towns, but from different language groups. And there was a rising through that whole summer of 1712 against Spanish colonial rule. In the end, because they were totally outgunned, they didn't prevail. But the Spanish were never able to capture Maria Candelaria. The people protected her and she faded back up into the hills. So she survived to fight another day. A lot of these women are very young. You'll find old women as well. But quite a few women in these movements are in their late teens, early 20s. So, for example, Toipurina in what's now Los Angeles. The San Gabriel Mission is founded by a Mexican colonists coming up the coast of California. And the Quiche Nation is there. And Toipurina is a young medicine woman. She foments a revolt because people may know this already, but the, the mission system was not a benevolent organization. It was, they were enslaving people. They were not only forcing them to convert to Christianity, but they were also suppressing and punishing the traditional ways. And so Toipurina, as a medicine woman, becomes a focal point who pulls together an attempt at a military overthrow of the mission. And it fails because someone within the ranks reported them. And so when they came with, I think, a couple hundred warriors to the mission, they lost. But Toipurina... There is a little bit of record there from her who she's really defiantly fighting back against the Padres. You know, she declares her hatred of what they've done to her people. And so she winds up being imprisoned and eventually they deport her all the way up to Monte Rey. The rest of her life is very hard. She doesn't live a, a great long time. But that that's a figure where... Uh, so I just talked to somebody about this the other day who is consulting with the Quiche Nation, the Quiche Nation, and he was saying that, you know, this is one of the primary women, Native women, who led a revolutionary movement like this in North America. There are other examples of women leaders, and, you know, we're, we're looking at a lot of indigenous traditions in the Americas. We could look at, for example, the Quechua people of Peru, the, the predominant nationality in Peru at the time of the Spanish conquest. There's a fascinating book uh, by Irene Silverblatt where she catalogs this massive resistance 
by medicine women to Spanish rule. And that rule was not only military and political, but there was also the religious arm of that. So the priesthoods did a lot of repression in the villages, trying to force complete cultural change. And so the medicine women wind up being this focal point of Quechua resistance. And many times they are the ones who speak out when the priest has someone flogged in the village or when soldiers or officials are sexually harassing women or are beating men and marching them off to labor in the silver mines. And so there was a woman named Juana Icha who was a medicine woman who spoke out openly against the priests in many, many situations. And they couldn't really get at her because she had such a across the board support from the the common people, from, from the native people in her community. But eventually she winds up being tried by the Inquisition because she's someone denounces her. So they're accusing her of witchcraft because she's practicing the old religion of the Apu, the mountain spirits doing the ceremonies and the denunciation of her says Juana Icha cries to the sun and moon and to the stars so that you see this trace of what the the beliefs were. But this was a kind of resistance that was really grounded in the culture. She never led a religious, I mean, sorry, a a military uh, movement, but she did lead cultural resistance, cultural standing up against Spanish domination. And this is on a very local level with the local soldiers and priests and, and various Spanish officials. So it was risky to do this, and yet she did it. She had like a lot of spiritual heart. So if you grow up in the Philippines, you will learn probably about Gabriela Silang, but most people in other parts of the world would not know about this woman who led a military resistance against the Spanish. And there are a lot of examples like that. There's a fascinating woman in central North Africa. She was a Hausa woman from a group of the Hausa that had not converted to Islam. This would be in the 1800s. And there was a group of French military that were tearing through the countryside, burning villages, looting, committing all kinds of horrible mayhem. And nobody really seemed to be able to stop them. And so this woman is named Sarawanya, let me say it right, Sarawanya, Sarawanya which means queen in Hausa. And so she had some kind of uh, political standing among her people. But she was the person where everyone else failed who managed to pull together an effective military resistance against these war parties that were ravaging the interior of North Africa. And she put paid to these two, this, this, this group of French adventurers and finished them off. So there are those kinds of military actions that come in And they're really off the radar of the histories that we're told about. You are listening to Full Circle here on KPFA. My name is Darlene, and in this segment of the show, we are hearing from Max Dashow of the Suppressed Histories Archives, giving us a few tidbits from the massive archive with a few examples of women as leaders of insurrections and responses to oppression. And back to my guest, Max Dashu. So if we look still in North America, there are some very interesting figures in the Southwest. And one of them is a medicine woman named Lozen, who is among the Chiricahua Apache. Her brother is actually the chieftain of that group. And they are in a situation where they're fighting both the U.S. and the Mexican armies and running back and forth across the borders and trying to stay safe. And Lozen, when she was initiated into womanhood, received certain powers in Apache tradition where she was able to tell where the enemy was coming from, how far away they were, how many of them there were by standing and holding her hands up. And she could sense this. And she was able to keep the Apache safe for a long time by doing this. At one point in the constant wars that were happening then, 
she stayed behind with a woman who was giving birth and she escorted her back to the reservation because she wasn't going to be able to survive with her baby running as the Apache were then. And so while she was gone, the Mexican army attacked them in the mountains of Chihuahua and they were decimated. Somehow Lozen, having deposited her charge at the reservation, comes back over across the border to Mexico, manages through her power to locate where the people are and lead them back to the United States where she eventually winds up joining forces with Geronimo. So she is one of the last fighters in the Apache resistance. This is one of the last native military resistances against the U.S. Army. And eventually they realize that the Apache are going to be wiped out. And so they surrender. And both Geronimo, a bunch of other people, are deported by train to the Gulf. So they take them far away from their desert homeland into a very damp place. And then people begin dying of tuberculosis and other diseases. And so that's how Lozen meets her end. But the photograph that exists, and this is the only picture of her we have, is sitting outside a railroad car, and she has this fierce look in her eyes. She's glaring at the camera. She's sitting there with her girlfriend by her side. And th this moment is recorded, so you can see the indomitable spirit of Lozen. And there are numerous tributes to her from Apache men as being one of the great warriors of the people, as well as one of the great minds that, you know, the great strategists in, in the Apache resistance. There's another fascinating figure out of Zimbabwe. And this is in the period where the Rhodesians, Cecil Rhodes and his mercenary armies are beginning to invade Southeast Africa. And a woman who is a lion oracle of the Shona people, Nahanda Nyakasikana, or sometimes they just call her Ambuya, which means grandmother. She's one of a whole lineage of lion oracles that begins maybe 500 years before. She becomes the leader of the first Chimurenga, which is the freedom struggle of the people against European colonization. And so there again, you've got that fusion of the spiritual leader with the, the head of a military resistance. And they did well for a while. They were actually holding their own against the English armies. But Cecil Rhodes kept going back and getting mercenary armies, troops to, grow, to add in there. And they have Gatling guns. So they're using machine guns. And there again, it became very clear that the Shona people would be either wiped out or they were going to have to surrender. And so she does so. And the English wind up trying her for sedition which is ridiculous since this is her country, not theirs. You know, she owes no allegiance to the British Empire. But she was defiant until the last moment. And so as she's mounting the ga gallows, she is dancing and singing her defiance. She refused to convert. They were trying to baptize her up there on the gallows. And she just held her truth all the way through. And so she became a great hero for Zimbabweans in the 70s when they were fighting to overthrow the white supremacist rule of the Rhodesian government. And so Zimbabwe at that point actually becomes called Zimbabwe and the no, is no longer Rhodesia. Very important, inspiring figure. We could look a lot further back in time to see this pattern of women leading insurrections and resistance movements. And we can see, for example, in Vietnam, the Trung sisters. This is the year 60 in our calendar. And they were female generals that led a Vietnamese insurrection against the rule of the Chinese empire. And not only were they generals of this movement, but they also had a lot of other women warriors involved in it as well. So both men and women are fighting for Vietnamese independence. And she remain, the, the two sisters, Trung Truk and Trung Yi, are memorialized. There are temples to them. And so you can see murals or reliefs. You can see reliefs of them riding on the backs of elephants and leading Vietnamese warriors into battle to defend their country. The same time frame, 20 years earlier, we see a tribal Celtic priestess, queen, chieftain, however you want to call her, named Budica. And she belonged to the Ikeni tribe, 
which is now southeastern England, over there in Norfolk area. She led a revolt against the Roman Empire. She fought the Roman legions, and she burned Colchester and London to the ground. This was based on atrocities that the Romans had committed against her own daughters and their refusal to recognize her as a chieftain after her husband died. So that this was really a wrathful visitation, the actions of Boudica against the Romans. And we see a couple other examples of this from the Druidic side on the continent. And the most famous of them is a woman who's titled Valletta. The Romans are treating this as her actual name, but it's a title. We know this word from Gaulish and Irish and British languages that it refers to a seeress, to a female knower. And so Valletta of the Brook Terry tribe leads a confederation of both Germanic and Celtic tribes against the Roman Empire. This is around the same time as Boudica. I think it was around the year 60, if I'm remembering correctly. And they succeeded in actually defeating the Romans at the beginning. This is the pattern in a lot of these places, is that initially they do well, and then eventually the empire strikes back, and it's very really, really tough going. Uh, so Valletta is a seeress who lives in a tower, and they do for a time defeat the Romans, and then eventually are overwhelmed by them. The thing about this that's interesting, and this is, I think, important for us now too, is that there's a similarity in what Maria Candelaria did, which was both of them put together a confederacy or a coalition, as we would ter call it in our modern terms, of resistance. Because it's one of the patterns of domination is divide and conquer. That was the Roman conqueror Julius Caesar, quote from him. And picking people off one group by one, whether they are an ethnic group, as happened in the invasions of North America, or whether they are political constituencies, as we see ourselves being divided in, in some ways in North America now, it, the importance of having a unified front is crucial to the success. And when they fail, it's because people begin to peel off and say, well, you know, I'm going to save my group and you know they they don't they don't any longer hold that coalition which is crucial and this is what i really think is the principle we have to learn is how to do coalition how to work together fight together on the issues we all care about and not fight with each other and splinter off all this fission that you see happening and this is a really a, a matter that happens this is really something that happens to a lot of liberation movements, is the splits wind up dooming the effort. And there we have to end things for this evening. You have been listening to Max Dashu of the Suppressed Histories Archives on just a few examples of women in leadership roles in people's insurrections and resistance. This is KPFA 94.1 FM, and we'll be going out tonight on my segment of Full Circle with a women's honoring song from the Native American group Ulali. Enjoy.
That brings us to the end of tonight's show. A big shout out to graduate apprentice Darlene Pagano for contributing that excellent interview with Max Dashu. You can get more information about Max Dashu and her work with the Suppressed Histories Archives on our website, kpfaapprentice.org. And stay tuned in a couple weeks for another interview with Max Dashu from Darlene Pagano. That's it for us tonight. Our executive producer is Miss M. Our technical director is myself, Frank Sterling. I have also been your host tonight. Joy Moore is our production consultant. And that wraps it up for me, everyone. Please, please, everyone out there, protect your health and your humanity. And stay tuned because up next is La Onda Bajita. A new proposed bylaw amendment to shorten the amendment process is available for public review at pacifica.org prior to a vote by the national and local Pacifica boards. Again, this amendment is available for review at pacifica.org. Thank you. Thank you to all of our loyal listeners who continue to amaze us. You keep KPFA from yielding, sinking, or losing our courage to be truly independent. You bolster and sustain us. No other public radio station can truly say this and know it's true, that we are proudly listener-supported. Thanks again from all of us here at KPFA. Hi, I'm Allie Budner, reporter for the Mountain West News Bureau at KRCC Radio in Colorado Springs. I'm also a graduate of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program at KPFA. The program is accepting applications. You can download an application at kpfaapprentice.org or call the station at 510-848-6767, extension 235. You are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. Hey.